Father God, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we just already received this amazing word that a seed planted good and deep soil and that more seed is coming, Father God, that you're growing us and changing us and that your word will produce in our future. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, you be our teacher. Teach us what we need to know and prepare us for what's coming in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening to you all. What a great, uh, I just want to applaud you all. Uh, you know, it's a Wednesday night and here you are investing in your future and in your family. And in today's culture, this is not normal behavior. And so we greatly applaud you. You're making great. And this will make a difference in your life. This is going to sow into your future. This is going to strengthen your family. Amen. And tonight, so uh, Pastor Scott and Holly were just sharing there on, on church. And as they segued into this teaching, this is what we really want to share on is um, we want to talk to you tonight about how to keep a teen in church so that they'll stay in church for their whole life. It's such an important part of life, uh, being in God's house. And Barna Group did a study and just recently, and they, they do amazing studies, and they said that 70 to 75% of teens, once they leave high school and leave home, will not stay in church or stay connected to their faith Many of them will run from God. 70, that's three out of four who were raised in church who then go on and leave their faith or leave God and stop going to church altogether. And so we want to give you some tools. Yes. So our thing tonight, and it's great because I'm sure we have parents that are raising all different ages of children here. So if you're here tonight and you're like, I don't have a teenager yet. Well, you still need to hear this because you will have a teenager one day. <laughs> and there is one thing that you have to get right as a parent. Now, I'm just so passionate about this teaching tonight. There's one thing that you have to get right is making church a must in your family. The importance of church, it's the one thing that you have to do as a parent. The word says in Proverbs 22 and verse 7, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old... They will not depart from it. You know, when you're raising a teenager, you're actually raising a, a person that's going to be an adult one day. I know that's news to you, right? But <laughs> and we've, we've had a, a couple, three go off now. Um, but it's all about raising that teen so that when they grow old, when they get to that age, when they're going to step out of your home, they won't depart from what you have taught them. And you might say, well, you know what? That's very, very easy for you to say, Pastor Kelly, you're a pastor. No wonder your kids go to church. But you know what? I, I wrapped my head around that and I thought, you know what? I got to come up with an example for you of, of someone that I know that has kids that, that they have done this, that they made their life all about church. And actually, it was my parents. My parents, I'm, I'm the oldest of five children. I have four younger brothers. And... I went to my brothers. See, I got married when I was 19, so I didn't really get to experience how each one of them grew up under my, my dad and my mom. So I went to my brothers and I said, you know, what, why? Because here's the thing. All four of my brothers go to the church regularly. They, they are involved in the church. They have beautiful families. They're all married and they have wonderful lives. And I said, and I, so I went to each one of my brothers and I said, why did you go to church? Why did you keep going to church after you left mom and dad, mom and dad's house? Well, that's how we were raised. Mom and dad always made us go to church. Well, when we got to my brother, Pat, I said, Pat, tell me, you know, why? He goes, let me tell you a story. Me and Kyle, so they're the two youngest, okay? They were both graduated from high school and they both lived with my parents um, as they were going to college. And one Sunday, both boys did not go to church. And my brother said that when my dad got home that day, he knocked on both their doors, bang, bang, bang on their doors, get out here right now. And they had like this little common area. I can just imagine my brothers in their little whitey tighties, whatever you call them, <laughs> in the common area, um, just standing there going, oh my gosh. My dad's like, if you ever do that again to me, like you, you to live in this house, you must go to church every Sunday. This is, it, it is required. And if you do not go to church, you can go ahead and find somewhere else to live. And my parents, my mom and my dad 
or just adamant. Because here's the thing. When you go to church, you get to learn about, I mean, you just take one day a week and you can learn everything that God has for you. You can learn his promises. You can get set free. This is what happens when we expose our children to the, to the word. As they sit in Sunday school, as they sit in a service, God can move on their heart. And we need it. You know, every single week, you, 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 you're reminded to keep on loving, to keep on growing. You're reminded to keep on believing God. You're reminded to push out that fear. You, you're reminded to do that forgiving that you need. Every week when you come into God's house, you hear that declaration seed of God into your future. You hear that you can move mountains. You hear you can step out and try that business. And you're hearing that. We, we need that. Your teens need that. And and here you've got these these brothers, you know, and we need to look at strategies that work in life. So when you, you see a strategy that their brothers, her brothers are all flourishing, beautiful families, everybody's healthy, everyone's doing well, they're all very prospering. And so what are they doing? What, how did this happen? How do you get five, five for five, all five still in church? Your, your brother Kyle teaches the the healing class every January that we put on here at the church here. Brother Pat has been playing the drums in the worship team for 22 years. He's been playing the drums for the church. Your brother Corey uh, helped pastor the church in Scottsdale for well over a year. Now is back here with his, his wife, Julianne. And your brother Jason, uh, he taught this class for two years, the train up a parent class. I mean, how is this possible? And so you look at strat- look for strategies. Of- the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14 that you will know them by their fruit. And you see some fruit, and we all should pay attention to what that looks like. So we're going to give you four points uh, tonight, practical things that you can do to help keep your teen. And the great thing is, is whether no matter how you have, all of us are going to have, whether you have teens right now or not, don't shut me down. Like you're like, well, my kid's four. Listen, it's coming. <laughs> Write it down now. May- mark your calendar and reread this when they're, 12. Okay. So go ahead. Okay. So (laughs) point number one is to be proactive and um, intentional. As a parent, you need to be proactive and intentional about church. And you can't, um, here's the thing. Their salvation is not guaranteed on you going to church. Their salvation, their Christianity is guaranteed by the life they see you live. (laughs) Do you walk the walk and do you talk the talk? What does Christianity look like in your home? That's right. And be ready for your teen, by the way, to not want to go to church. I mean, me and Scott didn't want to go to church. Uh, we come up with all kinds. Of, and that's the thing. The teen, teens will know exactly what to say to you to keep them from having to go to church. They will know exactly what buttons to push and to trigger you. I remember I said to my dad, well, my dad had his own church, you know, and this is like 1988 or something. And I, I could drive. And so my parents would go off to church early and I would drive myself to church. And, and I said, you know, be on time, he'd say. Be on time. Don't you miss church. And so I said to him, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Because here's why, dad. You don't know this. But the youth pastor, he's teaching some weird stuff. He's teaching some, and that's why I knew what his trigger would be. He's teaching some crazy stuff, man. I ain't going to that. He's like, well, just, just go. You need to go. So I went. And, uh, and so then uh, I didn't know this, but at that service, there was a guest speaker and my dad had snuck in the very back and was just, he was investigating what I had said. And I didn't know he was back there. And the teacher taught, you know, the youth pastor taught. And then, and then I got out. And then later on that day, he said, so how was the youth class? You know, what did he teach on? I said, well, he was teaching some crazy stuff, dad. He was just out of control. He's teaching like worshiping angels, I think, or something weird like that. My dad goes, I was in there. You didn't see me, but I was in the back. And he taught a great teaching. And the, you know, the blood just drained out of my face. I was like, <laughs> I've been caught. You know, here's, here's the thing. You got to invest. Don't just believe them. They're gonna investigate. Uh, you, you, they're going to tell you stuff. They're going to be like, wow, they're all just fooling around in there. It's just a big sex fest in that youth. You don't want to be in there, dad. It's gonna make, they're going to corrupt me. They're all smoking weed afterward. They're a bunch of hypocrites. They're crazy. And I, I'm pure. I don't want to be around that, dad. I, <laughs> Mom, I just, and they just play games. They just play games. It's not even spiritual. They just play games. All the, listen, if all they did was play games, you wouldn't be complaining. You'd be in there. No, it's a great, they're going to say things that aren't true. And so, don't take their excuses as though it's, they know exactly what to say so that they don't have to be there. And here's the reality. A lot of the excuses that a teen will use on why they don't want to be in youth group or be a part of church. Like, I got hurt and then they're, but it's just gossip and, and I got my feelings and they're so clicky. And then when they hang out, I've heard them all. And, uh, and they don't want to, they just shun me when I go there. And, and there's things, dad, there's things. So she goes, I've seen some things. You got to be careful. And, and, and you have to remember this though. They're learning to weather adversity. 
And if they don't learn how to weather adversity, the church is the greatest training center in the world for family and relationships. There's no better training center in the world. This is how God established his family. He's like, puts us all together and says, play nice. And, and they're learning to weather and stay solid in their faith and remain. What, uh, they're being account- so, what, what, Because sometimes you do get hurt. The adults will say, I don't go to church anymore. Why? Because I got hurt in church. They didn't learn to weather adversity. Jesus said, we've got to endure a little bit. of. There's going to be pain in church sometimes. Did you know that? Yep. In the seventh grade, um, I, I was in youth group here at Living Word Bible Church. Um, the church was really, really small um, then, but um, we had a youth all-nighter. And um, <laughs> one part of the night we were, um, we were making like a McDonald's run. And I was in my youth pastor's car and there was probably like four or five other teenagers in there. And then we're at a stoplight. There was no traffic because like, I think it was like midnight, one o'clock in the morning. It was a youth all nighter. And all of a sudden the, the youth path pastor uh, screams out fire drill. And at this moment we all get out of the car and we're running around the car. Okay. You guys remember this? Okay. I know. Okay. So anyways, I got out. I, I started to make it around a car. Well, a boy was coming around this way and I ran right into him. My, my wrist snapped. I broke my wrist. And so we got back to the church, call my mom and dad. They come and pick me up. We go to the hospital. And I in fact had broken my wrist. So, okay. Fast forward to the next very next weekend and, and I'm going to church. Well, I'm embarrassed. I'm like, I'm 13 years old. You know, I, I'm like, I, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go to service. I just want to sit with my mom and dad. And they were like, okay, you can sit with us. So then the very next week comes and I'm like, you know what? I, I want to sit with you guys again. So I sit with, sit with them that week. We get to the third week and I'm like, you know what? I, I think I really just like to sit in here with, and my dad goes, you know what, Kelly? I know you got hurt you're fine. And now it's time to go back. And here's the thing. If I had not gone back, I would have met this man several years later. I met him in youth group. See, youth group so equips you. It gets you around people. And yeah, there might be some drama and there might be things that go on. And there, it's, it, it's developing relationships. It's developing their walk in the Lord. Because as they get planted in that youth group, they'll go to youth conferences together. They'll go to youth camps together. And those are the times that completely transform a youth, um, a teen's life. Well, in the same way that, that you, you can get hurt at church, you get hurt at the job, you get hurt in marriage, you get hurt in relationship. But we can't have deep, meaningful relationships without forgiveness. We can't have deep, meaningful relationships without staying power. And that word that, you know, what do we call it? Commitment or what God calls it, covenant relationships. And so they're learning these kinds of lessons in their teen years so that they don't quit their job on, a, on a, in some weird emotional drama because they got their feelings hurt or, or, or leave their spouse or leave their family one day because it got uncomfortable for a moment. No, but instead they learned in God's house how to keep loving, how to keep going, how to persevere, how to forgive, uh, how to endure some of the adversities that life brings us. Studies keep saying that I read that studies say that, you know, these young people are leaving church uh, three out of four uh, as they graduate. And, and it, but I would say, here's the five reasons why young people are leaving churches. And it gives it a blame. Every single one of them would really blame the church. Like it was the, the church's fault that the teenagers are leaving church. And, and, I, and I think that parents, we have to take the ownership back of our teens. We can't, we got to stop blaming the school. The school isn't responsible for why a kid drops out of school. That's not the school's fault. We can't blame the government. We can't blame the courthouse. We can't blame the president. We can't blame everybody out here for what's happening in our home, but we have to take ownership. This is my teen. These are my kids. What am I going to do? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, I even want to go back to that scripture. It says, parents, train your child up in the way he should go. And he won't, it doesn't say church, Train up the child in the way he should go and he will. It is the parent's job to train up that child. And can I just say something right here? You're not going to find a perfect church. You're not going to find perfect pastors. You're not going to find perfect leaders. But you got to plant yourself in a church that gives you a life-giving word. And that 
transforms your life and you get through all the drama because you're planted in that house. I meet with pastors all the time and we all notice this this trend that's happening in our society today that people just kind of bounce around churches. Now I love it that anybody even goes to church anytime. Any week you go, I'm just nothing but thankful that people go to church but uh, or watch on the stream. And I know we have a lot of people watching on the stream or even in the, in the drive-in uh, parking lot. We love you guys being there. But you know, so I'm just grateful for that. Uh, but there's a lot of people church hopping. They just, they don't really settle in one church. And, and here's the root reason why people are having a difficult time. We have two generations now living, adults, that were came from broken homes. The Xers and the millennials, all their parents got divorced. All of them went through tremendous amounts of abuse and rejection. And all the breaking of homes, what that does is as a child, hey, all these people that were supposed to love me didn't. So family eventually leaves. That's the taught. That's what we've been taught. Family leaves, family hurts. So when I get older, my defense mechanism is don't get close. I can't get close. Now, a church is a family, and it's a family restoration center. So when you go into God's house and people start saying it's a family, and then you start having meaningful relationships, I, a person who has got the defense mechanism will say, I have to leave you before you hurt me. So I'm going to get out of this church and go to a different one before I accidentally have a meaningful relationship where I expose myself to pain. And so it's gotten really easy. And sure, that's great. They're going from church to church and hearing all kinds of different word, but they're missing out on the point. The point of God's saying, I want you to really plant in a church, is that meaningful relationship and that pattern for family becomes the pattern that you take to your home and family to bring restoration so you don't repeat the generation's past mistakes. So if you're trying to make uh, uh, family work, but you never saw a good pattern of family, then you'll break your family. But if you go into God's house and you plant and you get around brothers and sisters and you learn how to love and you learn how to forgive and you learn how to have mercy and you learn how what commitment looks like and you learn how to sit next to a brother that you may not always agree with, but you love them anyways. It's in those deep, meaningful relationships that you learn a pattern that works in your marriage and it works in your house and it begins to work with your brothers and sisters and the mom and dad who left and suddenly you're honoring people who weren't even around for you and you're loving and forgiving. And then God starts to restore uncles and brothers and sisters. Why? Because the pattern takes root. And what is the world trying to do to us? Just keep, just keep. So don't, don't, don't show you. If you church hop, your kids won't stay in church. That's right. Sorry, I get, you wind me up when it comes to church. That's my, that's my, <laughs> point, get, number, so point number one was to be proactive and, and intentional. Point number two is to make God famous in your home. Teach your children to know, and there's, there's different points I'm going to talk about here. First of all is to teach your kids to know the voice of God. And what does that sound like? You know, I bet that if you were in the mall or at a park and you were to um, yell for your child, you or your husband, they would stop in their tracks because they know your voice. So we have to teach our children to know the voice of God. And we do, the scripture says this in uh, John 10, 27, it says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So you get them to know God's voice. You get them to know that inner voice on the inside of them. You know, Logan went off to seventh grade and I said, you know, you're going to be faced with all different people and all different situations. If you feel something on the inside of you that is like a no, that is God speaking to you. Don't do it. But if you feel inside an excitement, then it's a yes. Do do that. You're teaching them to know, to know that voice. The other thing is that, you know, when there's sickness or there's, we, we immediately go to, let me pray for you. What, what, you know, what's going on? Like, can I pray for you right now? We turn to Father God and give God the glory for, you know, I mean, we're always putting God famous, making God famous in, in our family. And I think we've done it since they were really little kids, but even like getting a really great parking spot, look what God did for us. If we got a really, if we went to a restaurant and it was packed out, but they, the, you know, somehow they got us in and we got the primo spot in the restaurant. Look at the favor of God. Look what God did. Making God famous in your home. And then put your kids on alert that God talks to you about them. There's the one thing that we have really done is because you know, no matter the age they are, but I think this is especially true with teenagers, is that letting your kids know that God puts you on alert to what's going on in their lives. 
Now, we have a daughter and three boys. Now, my daughter, she could come home from, from school. I could tell all over her face, her expression, something didn't go on good today, and immediately we can get to the problem. That was, that was, it was different with boys, for me, with my boys. So I, this is what I would do. Um, the Lord, I remember one spe- time specifically is the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night, and I immediately started thinking about Matthew. And so I just started praying for him. I just started praying in the spirit, probably prayed for about 45 minutes, hour, fell back asleep. The next morning when I, saw, when I woke up, I'm in the kitchen getting my coffee, and he comes in, he's getting his bowl of cereal. And I just felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to say, hey, I woke up in the middle of the night, and the Lord had me pray for you. Is, is everything good? Yeah. Why? I, yeah, everything's good. Everything's great. Oh, okay. I just wanted you to know that the Lord had me praying for you. I, I don't know. I just thought I'd tell you. So have a great day. That night when I was, I was actually getting ready to go to sleep, I would, had a TV show on. I was in my bed. I had a light knock on the door, and it was Matthew. And he, was, he was, had tears in his eyes, and he was like, I think I know why the Lord had you praying for me. And it was just a great thing. It was a breakthrough that happened. Letting your kids know that God speaks to you about them. And, amen. And you know, and, do, and don't let the enemy lie to you as you're sitting there and say, well, but God doesn't speak to you. He just speaks to pastors. He just speaks. Listen, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. He is prompting you. He is nudging you all the time. Listen to those prompts. Listen to that voice. God speaks to us. Uh, all of us, anyone who believes in Jesus has access to the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Don't let Satan lie to you. And number three is make church the great redeemer. If you're writing down four points, this is the third point. Make church the great redeemer in your family. We know Jesus is the redeemer, but you know sometimes we, we might say, well, my teen, there might be people in here that have a teen, or you might be people who don't, but one day you're going to have one, and you're going to say, you might find yourself saying, I don't know what to do. It's just too far. You know, they're, they're hanging around the wrong friends. They don't listen to me anymore. They don't pick up after themselves. The grades are taking a dive. I think, I think he might be on drugs. I think she might be addicted to something. I, I think she might be sleeping with her boyfriend. But whatever it is, you, you think it's, I don't know what to do. I had a lady call me just uh, two years ago. And she just, Pastor, I don't know what to do. My daughter, I just, there was a boy snuck into a room. We, I caught her two nights ago. And I kicked him out, and then I found weed uh, three days ago in her room, and her grades are tanking. She doesn't want to go to school. She slams the door. She yells at me. She won't listen to me anymore. What do I do? And I said, you know, let me ask you a question. Is she going to the youth event uh, this weekend? And she, he, she goes, well, no. And I said, make her go to that youth event. She goes, there's no way I can make her go to that. And so I began to explain to her, yes, she can. You're still the parent. You could make her go. And I explained to her that, you know, it's, you don't have to win all the battles. You don't have to be mad or fight about everything. You nag about everything and suddenly your voice gets very quiet to your kid. But you pick battles that you refuse to lose. You're still the parent. I said, you have to win this battle. I don't need you to win the battle of cleaning her room today. I don't even need you to win the battle about the weed or her boyfriend. Here's the battle I want you to win. I want you to win the battle that she goes to church this weekend. And I, and I said, it's 20, it's, I think it's $20 to go down to this youth event. She goes, I don't have $20. Yes, you do. You have $20 for your daughter. I'm positive that you can find $20. I could have paid for it, but I knew that she needed to make this investment. I said, fine. And I want you to do this. I want you to drive her to the church. Then I want you to stand in the foyer and not let her leave. Don't let her go to the bathroom or walk out the door and go wandering. You stand out in that foyer and make sure she stays in that room. And here's what she did. She did what I said. And that night, her daughter ran to the altar, broken and wept. And she gave her life to God. She gave up the drugs. She got rid of the boyfriend, the friend. She even, she was graduating from high school in just three more months. And she, she went to uh, Nashville and she joined the Kingdom Youth Conference. Uh, she stayed with them for a year where she studied the Bible and led worship for the ministry. She's now back here in this church serving God with all of her heart. It took one night. See, church, that one night could be the great. How many of us know that it's just that one moment? You don't, you know, every one of us in here knows that there was a moment when God hit you and he took over your life and he, bro- he wrecked you and you were ready. 
and you gave up stuff and you and stuff fell off of it and you got your life turned around. This is exactly those moments, isn't it? Amen. What I love about what you said also, and it goes back to the point that Pastor Holly made, is that we're giving you permission to be the parent. Mm. You gave that woman the permission to be the mom that she needed to be in that moment. And that's very powerful. The other redeeming quality um, of going to church is that they're going to hear that right message once a week. Here's the thing. They're going to hear a message that you may have been harping on them about. And here they come to church and they hear the pastor preach about it and they get set free. <laughs> One of our teens just had this avid thing about always complaining about everything. He was just complaining, complaining, complaining. And we kept, you know, saying to him, you just need to get into gratefulness. And, and then all of a sudden went to church and all of a sudden no more complaining. And we said, you know, what happened? Why are you not a complainer anymore? I mean, praise the Lord, but what happened? And he said, well, you know, the pastor was teaching about complainers and, and how they break down the family and what a weight and what a burden it is. And you know what? I decided, just decided in that moment, I'm not going to be a complainer. And we were like, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise God for Pastor Aaron Nichols. Come on and give it up for that great man of God. He's going to be teaching them exactly what they am. Brian and Corinne, too. So have your teens sit in one service with you once a week uh, as well. I, I love doing this. But once the kids get to the sixth or seventh grade, every one of my uh, kids has sat with us in church. I love what that does to the family. And they come to the adult service. I find that a lot of times if uh, kids are in the forever youth group and only in that youth group bubble, sometimes what happens is when they graduate from high school, they feel abandoned. They feel like their church ended. The high school group says, well, you don't get to stay here anymore. But they've never really connected on the inside of the the, the regular church service and really connected to the, the normal pastor. And, and even when they go off to college, they're going to know what it feels like if there's a familiarity of being in the adult church and not, not in the youth group. And so our kids will sit there and don't think to yourself, well, that, you know, it's too, they're going to, they might even say to you, I don't understand what they're saying. It's too over my head. Don't, don't fall for that. Listen, they're learning chemistry and biology and algebraic equations that you have no idea how to solve. They can easily handle the parable of the sower and the seed in your church service. And so it's such a great thing. And, and maybe even get them involved in church. Uh, this is a great thing that you can do is where you give them something to do. Maybe they run the cameras in the sanctuary. These kids are so good with technology. There's, they could run stuff in the back. They could become an usher, a greeter in the youth ministry, but it gives them a reason to have to be there, finding a way to be involved, but it also knits them into these really cool relationships that they start to form because when you work with others and you're doing things, it bonds you together even more. And they're ready for this. According to Barna, the study, one of the, one, of the, one of the points I read is that the reason that young people are leaving church is because they're biblically illiterate. And see, when, when a child doesn't really go to church, they're not really in very often and they're missing, they're not getting that Bible literacy that they need. Because uh, if they don't know the Bible, then here's what, they're, what's, here's what they get inundated with. Is someone at school says, well, you know, the Bible says blah, 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 blah. And then they go, it does. And, and, but if someone knew the Bible, they'd go, that's not what the Bible says. My son, Matthew, he shared this story with me. Now, Matthew's very outspoken. And so not all kids are like this. My other kids weren't like this. But in class, uh, the, 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 the teacher said, well, the, the Bible, and it was a religion class, and it's a public school. It was a Westwood High School. And, and then the kids were saying, well, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says blah, 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 blah. Like, and it was like this bad thing. And then Matthew goes, that's not what the Bible says. And they're like, yes, it does. And he goes, no, it doesn't. I've read the Bible. It doesn't say that doesn't say that anywhere. Here's what it says. And he told them what it said about that topic. And, th and this is what God's like. And they were like, well, how do you know? And he goes, because I read the Bible. And then he said, do you read the Bible? No one in there read the Bible. They were like, well, no. And then he said to the teacher, do you read the Bible? And the teacher goes, well, no, I haven't read it. And then he was like, well, then you, don't, you guys don't know what the Bible says then. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, Matthew came home, you know, he, he always picking fights in the classroom. Not, not all kids are like that, but here's the great news is that when a kid is bi biblically literate, see here at the church, they're going to get Bible every single week. They're going to get another story about Abraham, a story about Noah. They're going to find out about the love of God. They're going to find out what God really says. They're going to find out the truth. And then we have Bible, uh, um, Bible junior college that we do every Wednesday night. So they could really get into the kind of the honors class of Bible and get, and then they come into the sanctuary and they hear about the Bible. They're getting Bible literate. And then when their faith gets challenged, they can just simply go, but that's not what the Bible says. And that's not who my God is. And the last thing, yes. Number four, it's very easy. Uh, number four is very easy. And, and we are to time. It's, it's a preemptive faith talk. 
Um, you know, before the kids hit seventh grade and start getting inundated with atheism, have what I call the preemptive faith talk. You talk about their faith before the teacher gets to them. Here's what you're going to get. Here's what's going to happen when you get to, to school, especially in the junior high and high school and college, is they're going to lie to you. They're going to lie to you about evolution and atheism, and they're going to lie to you about Christianity. And so I want to arm you with what you need so that you're not... See, because Christian came home one day, uh, Christian, my oldest, and I wasn't ready. He was a sophomore in high school, and he said, Dad... Uh, and, you know, I said, are you okay? He said, yeah. Um, I found out today that there's like between the different Bible translations, which there's thousands of them from ancient times, the New Testament translations, when the translators go through, I found out that there's a hun hundreds of thousands, if not uh, thousands of, of uh, discrepancies between the different translations. And he said, and so the teacher was saying that because of that, the Bible's been abandoned as any kind of truth. And, but you've always taught me, Dad, that the Bible was true and infallible and God's word. He's like, what do I do with this? So I said, I don't know. I said, I, you know, I was like, I know God is true, but I, here's, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to look into this, whatever this teacher just said to you. I don't know the answer to this, but I'll find out. So I ordered a couple of books, one of which is this one here, Jesus More Than a Carpenter. And this one really describes that particular argument that atheists have that they say over and over again. And it showed that of the thousands of translations that have differences between them, that they're always just simple punctuation marks or capitalizations or just a slight misspelling of a word where it, they're very simple. None of, none of any of the errors change any of the meanings of any of the scriptures. And so, so I brought this to him and then he took that back to his teacher in his class, but he needed that information to defend his faith. And if they don't have the information, this is where they can get lied to and take it. And I didn't know. And here's the reality is that we need to know as parents, you know, it's not okay to play the ignorance card and go, well, I just don't, I don't know. I just, I love God and Jesus is real. So you're going to be fine. You know, you can't, you can learn this stuff. Anybody can. We could just turn off a Netflix show and read a couple books and be ready to talk to our teen in an authoritative way. And this church does a Genesis conference every August because we want to prepare kids to be able to defend their faith with the kind of information I just gave you. And, and this church does a class on apologetics every uh, every September, the six weeks long where the, the kids can sign up and go and get all this information. And you could go too and hear all this information. But I brought these two books out. This is a really life-changing book. It's called Jesus More Than a Carpenter. And this book is only $4 on Amazon right now. It is an incredible book. It's an atheist journey in finding Christ. It's a very thinker's book. And he goes through all of the, the different arguments against Christ and, and disputes them. And then this is a scientific book called Darwin Devolves. It's a much harder read, I would say, when a kid is 16 years old and really getting into the sciences. This is a great book for them to read because it's a biochemist who, who is a Christian who shows you clearly and without fail that evolution is not the origin of life. And he shows you how to argue your faith. And so both these books are really good. I encourage you with them. But um, as we close, um, I'd like to pray for you, Pastor Kelly and I, if we could. Just pray for you before we dismiss. I think, I think I'd like to pray two things. One is, if you, haven't, if you feel like you don't hear from God, I want to pray for that. I want to I make sure that you're hearing from God and that you're confident in that. And the second one is, if you're in a situation with a teen that's in a troubled place, I want to pray about that right now. And I want to stand, we want to just stand with you in faith. And so just, just stretch out your hand toward heaven, if you would. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you speak clearly. You said, Lord, in your word, you pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Anyone who believes in your son, Jesus, has your spirit. And that spirit is our inner witness. That spirit is, is leading us through those light uh, still small words that we hear. And Father God, that if anyone's been in here and they've said to themselves or to the others, so I just don't hear from God. I wish God would talk to me. That Lord, those are just lies from the enemy. We wash that clean. We give over those things. Those words have no power now. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I declare a clear voice, a clear nudge that Holy Spirit, there's a renewed vigor and a fire in every place that you take and every step you direct in their lives in Jesus name visit them in dreams and in visions father that they would know clearly what it is that you're saying and Lord I pray for every teenager in this place that maybe is in a troubled spot Lord you said that you would work on the hearts of men 
And so we're trusting you now, Father God, to work on the hearts of the sons and daughters, the teens that are in troubled places. Visit them in the night. Bring the right people into their lives. Lead the wrong friends out of their lives in Jesus' name. And Lord, the next time they're standing here in your house worshiping you, we just give you permission to invade them, Father God. Just, just blow over them, wreck them, Father God. Just bring them right to tears in Jesus' name. Show them your love and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.